I want to welcome everybody to um, our Jones seminar today. Um, our speaker is Dr. Jingji Yu. She obtained her, her Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering with minors in uh, multidisciplinary design and mathematics from the University of Michigan. She then obtained a PhD from Princeton in material science and mechanical engineering. And she's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Mayo Clinic. Today, she's going to talk to us about mechanical behavior of biomedical and biological materials from breast cancer detection to vascular embolization. So, uh, Dr. Yu, it's up to you. Thank you. Great. Um, let me share my screen here. See it. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you very much, Professor Baker, for the kind introduction and uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Jingji Hu, and I'm a postdoc research fellow at Mayo Clinic. It's a great pleasure to be here today and share with you of my work on the mechanical behavior of biomedical and biological materials. So we'll be focusing on both aspects of materials. Biomedical materials basically mean something we create, something we engineer for biomedical applications. And in terms of biological materials, you can think about it like something coming from directly from our body, like cells or tissues. So uh, we will take a look at how we can leverage mechanical engineering and material science principles for healthcare applications. So um, biomedical and biological materials, they are usually complicated structures with multiple components. And the mechanical interactions between these different components, as well as their interactions with their surrounding environment, governs their critical behaviors and lifetime performance. However, the underlying mechanics and the mechanism controlling these processes are not fully understood. My research therefore contributes to this understanding by um, looking at these interactions at nano, micro, and micro levels using integrated um, experimental, theoretical, and computational approaches. My research is also application-driven and so far has been focused in two areas. One is in cancer detection, another is in vascular repair, which I'll be talking to you about today. So first, we'll talk like, take a look at uh, cancer detection. So cancer is a global health burden. And um, for women, breast cancer is the most top, top, common type of cancer that happens to them. And actually, one in every eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetimes. These alarming statistics ar arises from the fact that there are limitations in both current detection and treatment method. Therefore, the ability to detect the lesion early and to treat them locally are critical for the successful management of any type of cancer. We are looking at a subtype of cancer, breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. It means they are ER, PR, or HER2 receptors negative. So receptors, these are proteins that can express on the cell membrane, cell membrane and you can think about them as locks. And for the currently available treatment methods, either, for example, by hormone or by antibodies, you can think about those as little keys. So once we have lock and key system, the cancer can, the breast, the certain type of breast cancer can be, have a, a treatment plan. But triple negative breast cancer do not have any of those locks, meaning that it is not responsive to currently established treatment techniques. Therefore, they're associated with unproportionately high mortality rate compared to other type of cancer. In addition, they may exhibit the benign features in medical imaging, which further delays their prognosis and um, uh, detection. So driven by this problem, we're hearing trying to come up with alternative engineering approaches that can enhance the early detection and our understanding in the context of uh, triple negative breast cancer. One of the approach we took here is to design tumor specific nanoparticles to target these lesions inside of the body. One of the um, imaging modality for breast cancer detection is magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And here we're looking at a human um, breast cancer inside of the breast. So the current uh, um, special resolution of MRI is on the order of millimeters and that corresponding to hundreds of millions of cancer cells. So there is a higher chance it's already being a later stage of cancer. Therefore, there is a clear need for enhanced detection and uh, special resolution in the MRI. 
As I mentioned, triple negative breast cancer do not express the three common expressed receptors on their cell membrane, but approximately 50% of triple negative breast cancer express another type of receptor called the luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, LHRH. As you can see, these, are, these receptors are being stained with screen fluorescence, which are absent in the normal breast cells. And uh, using these characteristics, we're here in design tumor specific nanoparticles aimed to target the um, overexpressed LHRH receptors on the cell membrane of triple negative breast cancer cells. And our ultimate goal is to enhance and to target the lesion inside of MRI through the whole body scan. So here is how the nanoparticle looks like. It has a magnetite core with um, polyethylene glycol coating, which is used to reduce the aggregation and to promote elongation inside of the body. And uh, we then conjugate tryptorolin, which is an LHRH agonist, it's a peptide, onto the surface of these nanoparticles, aiming for specific targeting. And uh, we checked the uh, particle sizes before and after conjugation, and we see there's a negligible change of the particle diameters. And they also, they all preserved the spherical shape after conjugation. So these results suggested that there is negligible aggregation occurred during the conjugation process. There are many groups and work have been done on the tumor specific and peptide, um, peptide conjugate nanoparticles. So what makes our work different and unique is that we're looking at interaction between these nanomaterials and biological cells. And to you, and to, and to use the understanding of adhesion for the more rational design of nanocarriers in the long term. And we do this through both um, experimental technique and simulational um, techniques as well. So first, we want to quantify uh, the interaction between the ligand and receptor, and we do so through an approach called atomic force microscopy. During this approach, we um, dip coat the AFM tip with either peptide nanoparticles or peptide conjugate nanoparticles and measure the interaction force to the substrate which are coated with either breast cancer cells or normal cells. During a typical AFM force measurement, the cantilever, the tip, get in contact with the substrate and the cantilever undergoes elastic bending. During the retraction process, because there is this interaction between the tip and the surface, the tip cannot detach a force of zero, but keep undergoing bending until it's being detached from the um, substrate and returned to the baseline. This jump of force here is what we call adhesion forces that we are interested to characterize. So here we summarize the adhesion forces between different uh, pairs, and these include tryptorolling ligands, pad-coated nanoparticles, and tryptorolling-coded um, nanoparticles. As, as well as, so we're looking to their interactions to either breast cancer cells or normal breast cells. So this is the, um, the summary. What we noticed that is when we have uh, functionalized the nanoparticles, the, it has over four folds of interaction to the breast cancer cells compared to normal cells. This indicates that there is a clear specificity of uh, the interaction between the ligand conjugate nanoparticles to the surface of triple negative breast cancer cells. And this is, again, due to the overexpressed LHRH receptors on the surface cell membrane of the triple negative breast cancer, uh, sorry, uh, triple negative breast cancer cells. And in addition to the receptor ligand interaction, what we found is also interesting, uh, so quite unexpected, is that even without uh, the uh, tryptorolling surface um, uh, ligands, just with the pair-coated nanoparticles, there is almost a seven-fold of increase of adhesion to the normal breast cells compared, sorry, to the breast cancer cells compared to the normal breast cells. This result tells us that the PAG polyethylene glycol coating can serve as um, also as an additive effect for the adhesion forces, which further enhance this adhesion interaction between the nanoparticles and uh, the breast cancer cells. We took a further look at where this um, adhesion interaction is coming from by looking at the molecular origin using MD simulations. And we performed MD simulation between the surface of, between the different components on the surface of uh, the nanoparticles. These include tryptorolling ligands and uh, polyethylene glycol coating and also to the uh, components on the cell membrane. These include LHRH receptors and uh, uh, um, cell membrane lipids. 
So we indeed notice there is appreciable amount coming from the receptor ligand interaction, but uh, the highest interaction actually coming from the pack holding and LH receptors. So this MD simulation result are in agreement with what we observed from AFM measurement. So from this adhesion study, we see that uh, there's a specificity between the tryptorolling ligands and triple negative breast cancer um, cells. And uh, we envision that uh, this AFM um, microscopy technique can also be extended to scan over not only a cell, but perhaps also a piece of the tissue to facilitate the biopsy process outside of the body. So the adhesion, um, specificity adhesion between the nanoparticles and uh, biological cells can lead the nanoparticle entry into biological cells through a process called receptor mediated endocytosis. So in this section, we'll take a look at how the nanoparticle actually enter into these cells through both modeling and uh, experimental observations. So during this uh, nanoparticle entry process, there is a change of the uh, cell membrane energy, which can be divided into three parts. So there is a receptor ligand binding. You can think about it as lock and key system. And this specifically leads to the um, elevated elastic bending energy of the cell membrane. There's also a loss of configura configurational entropy of receptors due to immobilization. We first look at how a single particle an individual particle can enter into the cell. And uh, we followed uh, the work by Professor Hua Jian Gao uh, on the mechanics of receptor mediated endocytosis. So what is happening here is when a nanoparticle gets in contact with the cell membrane, the local receptor density on the cell membrane, which is initially here, arises to the same level of the ligand density that is on the nanoparticle. And this causes a depletion of receptor density at the contact front, whereas at the remote area of the receptor, it still has the initial receptor density. So by combining all the change of uh, free energy terms, which we show on the previous slide, we can get a um, change of free energy of the membrane showing in this equation here called FT. But during experimental observation, we see that the particle do not really enter as a single identity, but rather enter as a clusters, meaning that they have neighbors. So we extended this model to account for this additional uh, change of free energy between the nanoparticle, nanoparticle, nanoparticle medium, and nanoparticle cell membrane to look into how a cluster can enter into the uh, biological cell. So by incorporating this additional amount of change of free energy, we, uh, we obtain this new equation that is showing the change of free energy of the cell membrane in the case of cluster entry. And by balancing the uh, chemical potential of the receptor just in the contact front, we can extrapolate the receptor density showing the, in this equation, in this expression over here. And this is important because for the encapsulation process to complete, we have to satisfy two boundary conditions. One is that the local receptor density has to be smaller compared to the remote receptor density. So there's a chemical gradient that actually drives the diffusion process for more receptors to diffuse towards the contact area that would allow the encapsulation of the nanoclusters. And in the second case, the total number of the receptors before and after encapsulation remains constant. So this is conservation of energy. Through this analysis, we see that uh, there is a, a range of the cluster sizes that the cell membrane can encapsulate. This is between uh, approximately 14 nanometers to 9, 10 nanometers of the radius. Uh, we also looked into, uh, into the kinetics part of this endocytosis process by looking at the wrapping time. So wrapping time indicates the point when a nanoparticle gets in contact with cell membrane to the point it's being fully encapsulated. And we look at uh, the wrapping time versus the different uh, nanocluster sizes in two cases. The first one is the cell to have less receptor density. You can think about it as a normal cell. And in the second case, there's a lot of receptors expressed on the cell membrane. You can think about interaction to a cancer cell. So when we have functionalized nanoparticle sizes, the same size of nanocluster when they're interacting with um, normal cells versus cancer cells, what we notice here is the time to be encapsulated into a cancer cell is significantly less compared to the time required to enter into a um, normal cell. So from a kinetics perspective, it again suggested that um, 
um, the the functionalized nanoparticles are more favorable to enter into the cancer cells into a faster pathway. And uh, we looked into experimental evidence of a cellular uptake of functionalized nanoparticles into triple negative breast cancer cells. So here are the representative images of uh, when we incubate the trip tryptorolin MMPs into cancer cell for both one hour and three hours. So blue are the nuclei and the green corresponding to the LHH um, staining. So what we notice here is for example, at three hours, we see these clusters, these are nanoclusters that are being encapsulated into the nucleus and also cytoplasm. And if we look at the sizes of these nanoclusters, at three hours overall have higher um, cluster size compared to that at one hour. And uh, these numbers are also in agreement with what we predicted from the thermodynamics and the kinetics models. And by looking at the cellular uptake of nanoparticle clusters in these three different scenarios, including the regular nanoparticle, non-functionalized nanoparticle and breast cancer cells, functionalized nanoparticle breast cancer cells, and functionalized nanoparticle and normal breast cells, we see the highest uptake percentage is in the second case where um, there's a specificity between the receptor and ligand. So this again suggests that these nanoparticles preferentially enter into the cancer cells through a receptor-mediated endocytosis pathway. So through this um, nanoparticle cluster entry study, we see that uh, the endocytosis arises from the interplay between kinetics and thermodynamics. When the particles are too small, the wrapping process becomes thermodynamically costly because the cell membrane has to do a lot of elastic bending energy. Whereas on the other hand, uh, the larger particles are also um, less kinetically favorable to enter because there's a lack of prof um, diffusion process. So from these uh, in vitro studies, we see that uh, uh, there is a significant higher amount of the uptake and specificity for the functionalized nanoparticle to enter into triple negative breast cancer cells. And we're hearing use uh, this characteristic, characteristics of looking to the design criteria into either drug delivery MRI or hyperthermia. So here, I want to show you some of uh, our work on the magnetic resonance imaging of these nanoparticles um, using intravenous injection into the nude mice. So what we're doing here is we inoculate healthy nude mice with human xenograft tumor, triple negative breast cancer tumor. And then we, uh, so these are the tumors over here and here. So these are representative uh, MRI scans. And then uh, we injected uh, uh, either non-functionalist nanoparticles or functionalized nanoparticles uh, through the tail vein, uh, which we call intravenous injection, meaning that the nanoparticle would undergo um, systemic circulation in the bloodstream. So what we notice here is compared to the pre-injection baseline, after 24 hours of um, uh, either nanoparticles, there is um, significantly decreased attenuation in the functionalized nanoparticle cases in accumulated in the tumor area compared to the non-functionalized nanoparticles. So from this study, we see that uh, our uh, nanoparticle can serve as a negative contrast agent in T2 imaging in, magnet in MRI, and uh, it can find a way to circulate around the body and accumulate it around the lesion area, also showing the specificity. Whereas longer term study and um, um, more rigorous analysis of different tissues are clearly needed to fully um, explore the potential of uh, these nanoparticles in the whole body imaging of MRI to detect the lesion. So uh, we talked about how we can um, detect the cancer inside of the body. Now I want to switch the gear a little bit and talk to you about alternative approach, which uh, we can use cell mechanics approach to detect the cancer outside of the body. So, uh, so cell mechanics has been associated with onset and the progression of different uh, type of human diseases. These include cancer, malaria, or sickle cell diseases. And uh, there are um, established the two boxes to probe um, cell mechanics, including AFM, optical tweezers, uh, microbiology, and traction force microscopy, just to name a few. So they're all associated with advantages and certain limitations. For example, in the case of atomic force microscopy, it is associated with the local indentation of the cell membrane. There's been debate on whether the mechanical transduction will affect the cell mechanical property. And in the case of optical tracers, the source is using a laser beam. So there could be potential thermal damage of the soft and delicate biological cells. 
in the case of the microreology and traction force microscopy, there is a need to infuse external tracer beads in order to probe the cell behavior and dynamics. And our goal here is to see whether we can leverage cell mechanical properties as physical biomarker to probe, to probe, to probe different cell um, states under physiological mimicking environment. To achieve this, we um, developed an alternative um, methodology using combined shear assay technique and dim digital image correlation to probe the cell mechanical behavior. And uh, using a shear assay technique, we can subject the cell, biological cell, under, uh, under a laminar flow in a flow chamber, which is used to mimicking the physiological uh, environment that allow a whole cell loading. And we can then track the cell deformation using digital image correlation. It's a non-destructive imaging technique, which is used to track the different, the same points at uh, different, the, the, the same location at uh, different time points. So the beauty of the cell is, uh, it's that it's a naturally patented uh, material, meaning that we can use digital image correlation technique to track the natural patterns exhibited on the cell um, surface and therefore can obtain the shear strain or shear stress, the deformation state of an entire cell um, under a single loading process. And uh, from this analysis, we see that uh, the cell exhibited its time-dependent shear strain evolution. Actually, this is a three-stage creep phenomenon of a biological material. So by treating the cells as a viscoelastic material, we use a Maxwell, Maxwell uh, model, which is a generalized viscoelastic model to fit the primary regime uh, of the three-stage uh, creep phenomenon. And from here, we can uh, extrapolate important uh, viscoelastic properties, including modulus, viscosity, or relaxation time. So here um, we summarize the properties of either modulus or viscosity of three different cell lines, including normal breast cells, less metastatic breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer cells, and highly metastatic uh, triple negative breast cancer cells. So from your left to right, the metastatic potential increases. So um, so what we notice here is there is a significant downward trend in the modulus and viscosity when the cell becoming have higher metastatic potential. So this result indicated that our methodology can successfully differentiate cell mechanics, um, the different cell states using cell viscoelastic properties. And we envision that this methodology can also be extended into the detection and diagnosis of other type of human diseases as well. We also take a look at uh, how the cell cytoskeleton structure are the difference between cytoskeleton structure of the when the cells have different metastatic potential. And because the cytoskeletal structure are one of the one of the governing factors of the cell mechanics, and we look at specifically at actin, which has been shown as the main um, uh, component uh, to govern the cell strength. So on the top three movies, what you're looking at here are single cell confocal imaging uh, movies that's uh, scanning the single cell from the basal plane to the top plane. And uh, again, the blue are the nucleus and uh, the green are the uh, acting flora, uh, are corresponding to uh, the acting cytoskeleton structure. Because we stain and image these, um, in, uh, stain, image these cells under identical condition, so what we're visually looking at here, the intensity directly correlated with the actual acting amount. And in the normal breast cells, we see that uh, uh, it has an overall more compact structure with more actin fluorescent intensity. And uh, also they are more compact with more dense uh, structure uh, of these uh, long um, organized uh, actin filament structure. And uh, so this is a different case in the highly metastatic triple negative breast cancer cell. You can see that the cell become more, more spread out with less acting and also a loss of organization. So these are very short fibers compared to the long filaments in the normal breast cells. And indeed, we also notice a clear downward trend of acting fluorescence intensity uh, when the cell becoming highly metastatic. And this is again in agreement with what we noticed in the cell mechanics that obtained from the uh, shear assay experiments. So this also helps us to explain that when the cell becoming highly metastatic, they start to lose their mechanical properties and that facilitate their migration 
through um, capillaries or pores that are much smaller compared to its um, sizes, where it can cause metastasis. So to quickly summarize the first part, we talked about uh, both in vitro and in vivo detection of the uh, triple negative breast cancer targeting and detection. And uh, um, I hope I can show you uh, this, these are the methodologies not only limited to the cancer detection, but can also be extended to uh, the understanding of other type of human diseases as well. So in the second part, I um, want to talk to you about more on the translational bioengineering approach, uh, where we are driven by a clinical and relevant problem called vascular embolization. And we use um, engineering approaches to develop new materials for vascular repair. So embolization is a minimally invasive procedure to intentionally block diseased vasculature for a therapeutic um, purpose. It, has a it can be treated with a wide range of uh, vascular diseases, including but not limited to hemorrhage, aneurysm, vascular malformation, liver cancer, and fibroids. So here are the two examples. Uh, the first example is fibroids. So these are benign tumors. These are not cancerous tumors. These are benign tumors that uh, happened, um, occurred on women's uterus. So a traditional way when the fibroids become unmanageable is to remove off this whole uterus. And as you can imagine, this is very disastrous, especially for young women who are not pregnant yet. But with the embolization, what we can do nowadays is the physician will puncture a hole on the groin and insert a long, thin tube into the vasculature. And this tube is what we call a uh, catheter. So then um, the physician will infuse embolic agents. In this case, these are microspheres that are on the order of a uh, few hundred of uh, micrometers that are comparable to the sizes of these feeding arteries. So as the name suggests, like hypervascular tumor, meaning that they have a lot of feeding arteries to provide the tumor nutrition, energy, and oxygen to let it grow. So the idea of embolization is to use these spheres to block these um, feeding arteries and therefore to starve the tumor. Then the tumor will gradually shrink and the patient will go back to normal uh, without the need of the removal of the uterus. And in another case where um, embolization is very uh, useful is in the case of aneurysms. Aneurysms are bulged structure on a blood vessel. They are delicate and prone to rupture. Aneurysm can occur anywhere inside of the body, but it's perhaps most dangerous when it happens in one spring because that can cause, if the aneurysm ruptures in the brain, it can cause internal bleeding and finally stroke of the person. And traditional way of treating aneurysm is to open a skull and putting a clip at the aneurysm neck to exclude it um, from the main artery. But with embolization, we can do it from a more a minimally invasive way by again maneuver the catheter to the vicinity of uh, the uh, aneurysm sac and deploy um, thin softer coils that can be made of either stainless steel or platinum. So the goal here is to use the coils to tightly pack this aneurysm sac to remove it, uh, to exclude it from the uh, parent vessel. And the idea here is to use it, to use the coil embolization to alter the local hemodynamic uh, behavior to promote the clot form that can further uh, stabilize the coil embolization to prevent uh, recanalization, meaning uh, the rebleeding of uh, this aneurysm. So compared to the traditional open surgery, uh, embolization really offers better outcome with fewer complications, lower cost, and potentially faster recovery of the patient. So here I talked to you about how schematically the embolization works. But in a clinical setting, in real life, how do we know where to target and where to deploy the embolic agents? And this has to do something with angiography, which is an imaging uh, technique that help us to visualize the blood vessel roadmap. And here are three key components in order to do angiography. So angiography is based on x-ray and um, um, in order to visualize, you may know like we can visualize bones because they are solid and dense structures. But in order to visualize the blood vessels, we use a contrast agent, which is radio opaque. So the idea here, here is we infuse this contrast dye into the blood vessels, and um, um, this can help to visualize the blood flow. So basically, the x-ray will capture where the contrast agent go. That can help us to see whether the blood, uh, where there's a blockage in the blood vessel. So basically, the contrast agent helps us 
uh, and the physician to visualize um, the, the, the flow pattern in a blood vessel. And in order to deliver this contrast agent, we inject it through the catheter using a syringe. So the catheter can be anywhere between 70 centimeter to uh, 180 centimeter. So literally anywhere inside the body can be accessed. So in a typical um, procedure, uh, this is an image showing what a typical procedure looks like. So the patient will lay down on the, operation, on, the, on the table and the physician will puncture a hole uh, through the skin and insert the catheter and maneuver it through the bloodstream to the area where um, the embolization can potentially occur. For example, in this case, it's around the brain. It's around the brain. And in order to visualize the vasculature, we infuse the contrast agent and uh, this can be visualized under fluoroscopy. So it also has a name called C-arm. As you can see, it has the shape of the C. So this device can move up and down, in and out. It's a real-time x-ray that allows the physician to monitor um, the vessel flow, blood vessel flow in real time. You can think about it as a TV. And this cannot be done with either regular x-ray or CT. So here I, I want to show you a closer look. For example, this is the renal angiography, which we're looking at the kidney. So basically the physician will in, insert a catheter. So this is a catheter towards the renal artery and infuse the contrast dye into the vasculature. So basically we can see uh, with the help with the contrast agent, the roadmap is clearly visualized under x-ray. So now we identify this area of interest. We can then infuse the contrast agent through the same catheter to achieve a blockage that will ensure the accuracy of where we actually want to block this vasculature. So for clinically used embolic agents, um, they're being mainly divided into two parts, solids and liquids. And in the solids, um, there are mechanical occlusion devices, for example, coils and particulates. So these are um, somewhere around hundreds of uh, micrometers. And uh, for liquids, one of the examples is MBC glue that can undergo liquid to solid um, phase transformation when it's in contact with the blood. So it basically undergoes polymerization. That's how it can form a solid-like structure to cast a blood vessel. But they are associated with certain limitations. So each of these different embolic agents have different limitations. But here we listed um, some common um, disadvantages of them, including toxic and organic solvents. Uh, these are usually associated with the liquid. Actually, another type of liquid is use of the DMSO, and it can cause a spasm um, toxicity once infused in the bloodstream. Also, the mechanical occlusion devices associated with the challenges of migration and compaction, meaning that uh, they can go distal, they can migrate. And this will cause recanalization, meaning that the already embolized blood vessel will subject to reopening. Mean, and then the embolization will be failed and the patient have to come back and subject to re-intervention. Additionally, uh, most of these uh, embolic agents we're using nowadays are not therapeutic. They're more for the mechanical occlusion purposes only, but do not promote tissue regeneration. There's also shaking artifacts with radio opacity, especially with the coils. And uh, lastly, they are not universal, meaning that they cannot be adapted to different type of the vasculature sizes. For example, we cannot use coils to uh, embolize capillaries um, in the uh, hypervascular tumors because they're too big. And similarly, we cannot use particulates to embolize a aneurysm, which is on the order of uh, one to two centimeter or even larger sizes. So driven by this clinical relevant problem, we're thinking how about, is there a way we can generate something therapeutic but during the meantime, it can process both the characteristic of a liquid and a solid, meaning that it can be delivered freely through a catheter like a liquid, but it can has the ability to cast the um, blood vessel like a solid that can give us the flexibility that cannot be achieved by the currently used um, embolic agent. So therefore, uh, we're motivated by this problem and came up with something called shear thinning gel embolic agent. Shear thinning meaning that uh, the uh, material has decreased viscosity with uh, increased the shear. When basically that's something we we're applying. Uh, the increased shear basically happens when we are injecting this material. So it would facilitate the transcatheter um, delivery. 
So this is what our materials look like in uh, outside the body in action. And uh, we used hand deliver, we hand injected this material through a catheter. So this is a tip of the catheter. It can flow freely through the catheter like a liquid. Um, but um, once the shear has been removed, it has this uh, solid-like behavior that gives the strength to cast um, the blood vessel to withstand arterial pressure. And this flexibility cannot be uh, achieved by the currently used embolic agent. And um, as, we as I've mentioned that, we also want to make this material um, functional, one of which important aspects of making therapeutic effect that gives us a bioactivity to promote the tissue regeneration in order to repair the um, diseased and damaged vasculature. And in order to do that, one of the major components we use is extracellular matrix. And extracellular matrix is where the cell lives. So it is the most natural home where the cell grow. So instead of a synthetically generated extracellular matrix, we um, extract the extracellular matrix, ECM, from the um, tissue. And uh, these are bioactive and also shear thinning. But the problem with the ECM itself, which I will get into in a little bit, is it's very, it's very soft and it cannot withstand arterial pressure. To solve the mechanical stability problem, we used a um, biohybrid approach by introducing synthetic nanosilicate that gives additional mechanical strength uh, of this uh, um, nanocomposite that is also shear thinning and antibacterial to give us other folds of uh, uh, multi multifunctionality. And uh, we combined these main two, two main components together and we tested, the sub, we tested the biocompatibility in a rat subcutaneous injection model as well as um, its embolic efficacy in a porcine model. So we first take a look at the decelerization process and uh, we took the left ventricle of the heart um, remove all the fat tissue and the connected uh, fat tissues and um, chopped it, finely chopped it and used the detergent to rinse away all the cells, only leave the extracellular matrices and then leophilize it. And the reason we select the left ventricle of the heart is uh, among all types of the decelerized organs, the, the, the left ventricle of the heart has been advanced the most into clinical trials. So its biochemical activity and um, um, biosafety has been rigorously um, established. And uh, we uh, confirmed the decelerization using the staining before and uh, after this process. So there's a loss of the nucleus um, after this uh, detergent washing. And we also stained the different uh, uh, the proteins, uh, adhesion proteins also have the regenerative uh, properties, including collagen one, fibronectin and laminin. And these are being uh, stained with um, red fluorescence in their respected uh, staining, which you can see their post uh, decelerization, there is still a preservation of these important um, uh, proteins. But the, the blue, which are DAPI, are the nucleus, they are absent in these, um, in, in these images, again, showing the successful decelerization of the heart. And uh, in order to make this ECM more manageable to make our gel, we um, solubilize it with uh, enzyme and uh, it can form a um, semi-solid gel-like structure and a physiological temperature. It gives an additional advantage that uh, this material uh, can strengthen itself at uh, body temperature that further stabilizes its um, behavior inside of the body. And through rheological testing, we see that the viscosity of the ECM itself is indeed shear thinning that can facilitate injection process. And we also performed the kinetics uh, study on using rheological um, studies um, by looking at the change of the modulus at 37 with uh, increasing the time. So we see there is a gelation process occurred when when the cells, sorry, when the, when the gels becoming more liquidy-like to the more gel-like. But the highest um, uh, G prime, which is the storage modulus we obtain here is 100 pascals. So this is too soft to withstand any arterial pressure. So um, G prime, I want to explain is the storage modulus. And um, you can think about it, the higher G prime is, the more uh, mechanical strength this material process. 
So uh, to increase the mechanical strength of this material, we took a biohybrid approach, um, basically using the taking advantage of the electrostatic interaction because the extracellular uh, matrix is a very complicated structure with uh, lots of positive and negative charges along the um, chains of the proteins. So we here in introduce um, the highly anisotropic charged nanosilicate with um, positive charges on the side and negative charge on the surface. So this so these, inter so, so these co different components uh, interact through the electrostatic interaction and form a highly hierarchical structure. It also helps with um, the deform and reform of the structure under shear, meaning under uh, the injection and recovery from the catheter without the compromising of the mechanical properties. We also include iohexo, which is an adenated contrast agent, in order to render our material radio opaque to help the physician with um, the visualization under real time x ray. And through this approach, uh, we, we, in, we were able to tune the mechanical properties of uh, the nanocomposite final gel from somewhere between um, less than 1,000 pascals to almost 7,000 pascals. So again, this is due to electrostatic interaction coming from these uh, different components interacting together. And through different uh, optimization and characterization, what we found is that when we have the highest amount possible of the highest ECM amount possible in our system, it is also corresponding to the highest cell viability. Meaning that uh, this material here exhibited both outstanding mechanical property and also bioactivity. Therefore, we selected this material to move forward for further characterization and also in vivo studies. And uh, in order to test how strong this material can, how much pressure this material can withstand, we performed the in vitro occlusion test by putting the gel in a tube and uh, measure the pressure drop uh, to displace the gel. So this is our final material, and it has over seven folds of increase compared to the regular human uh, physiological pressure, which is around 120 millimeter of mercury. And finally, uh, we inoculate our material with E. coli um, bacteria, and we see that compared to the E. coli itself, there is a 90%, over 90% of antibacterial property ex um, processed by our final material. And this is important because for any biomaterial that has to be implanted inside of the human body, it has to be sterile. And this antibacterial uh, test suggested that this material can keep its surrounding sterile to prevent sepsis and infection. So finally, we, we tested our material in a, uh, the embolic efficacy of the material in a, a pig model. And we selected the pig because it exhibited similar sizes and a vasculature compared to human. And uh, first of all, we looked into the iliac artery model and we select the internal iliac artery because um, it has higher diameter and have higher blood pressure. So it's representing extreme case of embolization. So before you infuse the material, first infuse the contrast agent. So basically showing this artery is patent. But after we introduce the material, we see that it's been blocked. And in the regular fluoroscopy image, we can see this is the material because we introduced the contrast dye. We blended the contrast dye in our uh, nanocomposite. This is important um, to, for develop of any of the embolic agent because it would enable the physician to know where to inject, how much to inject, and when to stop. We survived a cohort of uh, pigs for 14 days, uh, two weeks, and uh, on, from a whole body uh, 3D CT angiography image, we see that this embolized vessel is missing on the 3D CTA. It is still physically there. It is missing because there's no blood flow again, suggesting um, successful embolization in the long term. And by looking at cross-sectional view of these embolized vessels, we see that at day zero, there is a clear uh, margin between the uh, vascular wall and uh, the material. It's uh, homogeneously distributed in the lumen of the artery. But at day 14, there is um, this um, distinguishable feature is no longer visible, but the materials undergoes a lot of remodeling. And through analysis of these uh, micro CT images, we see there is over 75% of decrease in the uh, material volume, indicating it is undergoing biodegradation. 
And by looking histology images of the cross-sectional view, um, here I'm showing both trichrome and uh, uh, proliferating cells. So compared to day zero and day 14, there are two things, um, we, there are two major things. One is that there is a flux of cell activity inf infiltrating the, uh, the, the lumen of the other, infiltrating of the biomaterial, suggesting this, the material has been um, biodegraded. And additionally, trichrome stains the newly deposited collagen. So these are very faint um, blue, um, blue collagen showing here, suggesting the formation of connective tissue. This is important because when a connective tissue is forming, it means that it forms a permanent, it will facilitate a permanent embolization, meaning that recanalization is unlikely to occur. Different from uh, clinically used coils that are not biodegradable, meaning that the coil, for example, will stay inside of the body, inside of the vessel forever in the patient's body. And it can be subjected to the recanalization anytime in the near future. And uh, the prolifer through proliferant cell staining, these are these um, brown dots uh, showing that uh, the cells are, high, um, are highly active and the remodeling process are also highly active. We also want to look at how far these gels can travel into different sides of the vessel. And to do so, we use a porcelain kidney model. Um, so similarly, we first, infuse a, um, we first infuse a contrast agent to show the kidney vasculature. And um, after infusing our material, uh, it's not, not visible from a DSA. But uh, in the regular fluoroscopy image, we can see that the material have successfully occluded the main renal artery smaller arteries, and even smaller branches. So from CT images, we see that the kidney is missing, meaning that there's no blood flow in the embolized kidney. And this is further confirmed from the cross-sectional view, is that in this image, you can see that the uh, regular non-embolized kidney is bright, meaning that there's still blood flow uh, perfusion going in and out. But the embolized kidney is dark and showing necrosis. And uh, we analyzed and see a 30% of decrease after two weeks of survival. And from the gross images, um, it is more obvious to see that embolized kidney become necrotic and become smaller. And from histology analysis, uh, so these two are coming from the, um, the, this uh, red rectangle. And uh, we see that uh, the gel can penetrate down to 200 micrometer of diameter of artery. And from the renal cortex, which is the blue boxes here and here, what we see that is at day zero, just after embolization, the kidney has a regular structure showing the tubules and uh, glomeruli, which are the uh, regular, regular um, kidney structures that uh, help to filter out the blood and general urine. But at day 14, after embolization, those structures can be no longer seen. So there's the disruptive of uh, the tubal structures, but regenerative, newly formed connective tissue. So these are the evidence showing that this kidney is no longer functional. And uh, this has clinical relevant meaning is that, um, especially when a patient is trying to undergo kidney resection, uh, it is safer to first embolize the kidney in order to direct all the blood flow into the uh, healthy kidney. Therefore, when to, um, so this way can, the embolized kidney start to lose its function. So it can cause less, it can significantly reduce the trauma and bleeding during the procedure. And um, uh, we didn't notice any evidence of the gel in the renal cortex. And this is important is that it means that the, the gel didn't travel through the capillaries going to the veins and undergoes a systemic uh, circulation. Because if the gel undergoes systemic circulation, it can end up either in the lung or in the brain and causes stroke. And finally, we looked into the important organs um, inside, of, uh, inside of the pig and also all showing normal perfusion, suggesting that no distal migration occurred. That further suggested our, um, the, the safety of our material. So to, uh, in this part, I talked to you about a uh, ECM-based bioactive nanocomposite hydrogel for embolization. And uh, uh, to our knowledge, this is the first therapeutic gel-based embolic agent that's been reported so far. We have also worked on different fronts of embolic agent, including um, a point of care embolic agent and also looking to the different uh, contrast agents on the effect of embolic efficacy. Uh, and these two work just being accepted this week. And um, um, if you're interested, feel free to check them out. 
So to summarize, I talked to you about three different examples on how we are looking at the interactions between the different uh, uh, materials and their surroundings, including the nanoparticles and biological cells, cell mechanics um, for cancer detection, as well as how we can tune uh, the biohybrid design of the nanocomposite of their mechanical properties that help us to achieve the successful embolization using our large animal model. And taken all together, this work represented, um, I hope I can show you the importance of interdisciplinary, that uh, we can leverage materials, mechanics, and bioengineering approaches to deliver pro promising solutions that can help to elevate um, healthcare challenges, as well as some more different uh, um, societal needs. So with that, I want to acknowledge my research group, uh, my advisors, our collaborators, as well as funding sources, that makes this work possible. So the first part of work I, um, are supported by Princeton, Apple PI, and the World Bank. And the second part of the work are supported by Mayo Clinic and uh, NIH. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have.